Right. Good morning, everyone. Thomas, thank you. Thomas and Ami, thank you for this invitation and all the cool things you have been saying. Uh, I will start with this slide, which is... Okay. Okay, great. So this is actually 2017. And this is the first time I was presenting what I'm presenting now, but it was very rudimentary and fundamental in a place called Sampling Theory and Applications Conference. It's a little bit old school, uh, mostly people who have been doing harmonic analysis for a long time. Uh, and because I was doing something completely new and it, we, we did not really know where it would go, I thought it would be a good chance to like see. So what's interesting is that as my interest and research progress move from sampling and become more and more wider to computational sensing, which brings me here, it seems like Laurent in the fir first row is already here. And what's interesting is that, I mean, uh, maybe some of you already know, but uh, apart from my research career, I'm also very interested in imaging sensors. Many of my patents, many of my art is based on photography. And so I generally take around pictures, but one picture I managed to keep it memorably was this scan of Laurent's uh, notes on similar topics that I was working on. And this was written on a bus ride, so I managed to keep it. And uh, actually, indirectly, this has been a source of a uh, lot of things that I will show you today. The second interesting thing is that this is also a very interesting place where many people in the audiences are people I've known for God knows how many years and for no particular reason. So you can already see Thomas there, but this is from last week, but I've known him for quite long. But you also have. Uh, Miguel, who was the chair yesterday, uh, I've met him uh, five, six years back. We have one paper and some work. I know Ulubek when he started his master's at EPFL. Uh, Eve, I've known him as a, uh, he, he was sharing office with a good friend of mine. And of course, uh, Bhavani, who I've indirectly known for a n number of years, but only gotten to know yesterday. So it's a very interesting kind of mix of uh, venue and place. So let me start with something very uh, fundamental. We are sitting in this room. Uh, my voice is being communicated through this microphone, is digitally being captured and transmitted to everybody. And all of this is based on Shannon's pioneering work, how to digitize information. All of modern world technology that you use is based on Shannon sampling theorem. Now, if you look at the tr traditional viewpoint of how acquisition and algorithms are used, you start with some hardware piece, generally an analog to digital converter, then you use algorithms to process, and then you try to find the desired output. And actually, if you look at Instagram, it's doing the same thing. You capture a photo, you apply the filter, and you share it with your friends, right? And this has led to a lot of classical in, uh, applications. So you can relate to filtering, compression, denoising, whatever. These are all classical applications in the current world. But then if you look at last 20 years, there's been a lot of progress, like faster MRI scans. You have MIMO routers everywhere. Uh, people have been trying to detect things like gravitational waves, for example. And these things cannot be possible somehow, just purely based on the conventional pipeline. And why is that happening? Well, if you look towards the left, I don't know how many of you can identify this picture, but this is actually the mission control room for Apollo 11's uh, uh, project. And what you see on the right hand side is a modern day smartphone. And what is my purpose of putting this picture here? Well, computation is, become cheap, is becoming cheaper so much so that all of the computational resources on the left hand side are equivalent to the computational resources on the right hand side. And then the question is, are we actually using this computational power? Is Shannon way still the best way for machine perception, for machine listening and imaging and so on? And I can give you a clear answer that even if you look at things like image super resolution, which is a perennial topic in signal processing, image processing, if you go to a vendor like Canon or Nikon, they will typically try to increase the megapixels. They won't really rely so much on the, uh, on the nature of uh, uh, you know, algorithms. And why is that happening? Because people are not jointly harnessing this kind of uh, co-design. So if you look at this kind of hardware software divide, right? Hardware, people in hardware capture information, people in software recover information, and that's how it goes. That's how communities run and so on. There's a problem. No matter how much your algorithmic machinery is sophisticated, any loss in hardware will cause a 
compromised situation. So you can enhance, but there are limits set by the hardware, right? That's the first problem. The second thing is that we need to maybe think again, that is Shannon Nyquist model the right model for modern world machine perception, machine seeing, uh, and so on, because this was largely designed for human speech. And those are the things that have driven a lot of people, not just me, but a lot of people around. And that leads to this new viewpoint where the computational sensing comes into picture. And the idea is that instead of just capturing information as we used to do before, we will potentially encode the information in a very smart way. And generally when I say smart, it's basically coming from some mathematical insight that if we encode information in a particular way, we can get a desired target output that is more relevant to us. And that could be, you know, like you can go beyond conventional barriers. So you can minimize accusation complexity. Some of you may be familiar with massive MIMO and one bit sensing. So that's like minimizing complexity there. You can minimize data rates, cost, size, and so on and so forth. And this is something which is very interesting. So in my own previous uh, life, I've been looking at some of these things. We have designed cameras, time resolved cameras, microscopy has been made cheaper and so on and so forth. But one fundamental, okay. So on that note, I just wanted to say that we recently had this book with MIT Press. It's open source. So if you're more interested in imaging aspects of computation, imaging, yeah, you feel, feel free to download anyway. So one thing that really bothers uh, us is that uh, when you have a piece of hardware, right? Let's say I start screaming in this mic. At some point, this, the measurements will get distorted. And this is typically happening all the time. It's just that when we are acquiring this information, somebody has done the hard work to calibrate and make these calibrations very carefully. So what I will focus on today is how can we go beyond the dynamic range barrier? Like if you don't know what is the strength of your signal, how can you measure it? And I will show why is it so important. So I just wanted to thank some of my collaborators who have been uh, very kind to, uh, to latch on to this kind of a unique pursuit. And then some of my group members, two of them are here. I'll, I'll share more later. So let's start with the main idea. So just for the context, let's wind our clocks back to 1986, April. We had the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. What happened is that there was a lot of leakage of radiation. And what you see over there is a device called dosimeter. What is this dosimeter doing? You stick this dosimeter in the, in the air or the environment and it tells you what's the re reading of the radiation. What happened with Chernobyl is that the radiation was so high that it was, people say that it was around uh, 5,500 times higher than the measure, measurable limit. It's like putting a human thermometer in a pizza oven and trying to guess what's the temperature of the oven. It's not going to work. And because of this, all these readings were wrong and a lot of people had to sacrifice life because they thought it was safe to be there when it was not. And this is one clear example where limitation of dynamic range clearly has direct implication on what you are measuring and sensing and how you are making a decision on your immediate environment. The second example is that of uh, a self-driving car. So many of these self-driving cars are now equipped with cameras. Now here's an example of a car coming out of a tunnel. Because of the sudden exposure to sunlight, right? The camera saturates. And if there's a pedestrian at the end of the tunnel, the car will run over. And the solution to that is people start designing fancy cameras. And this is very exhaustive. And sometimes at the, at the point of being unaffordable. But this is not just the, uh, this audio, uh, this visual example that I'm giving, it's not the only one. If you also uh, dig out the uh, you know, case files from the NASA Apollo mission, you will see that for all kinds of extraterrestrial exploration, they, they don't know what measure, voltages to measure. So they, they, they basically deploy as many sensors as they can, but you can think that humanly it's not smart because you are not really, uh, you are constrained with some tight budget and this kind of technology is not going to work. So how do we, so how people are looking at this problem in a contemporary sense? So people either focus on hardware, what can we do with hardware or what we can do with software and algorithms. So with the hardware, the idea is that you'll either increase the number of ADCs or you'll make some automatic gain control and things like that. And no, none of them work perfectly. So for example, for those of you who are familiar with ear implants, if you use the automatic gain control in your ear, your perception or intelligibility of sound will change. So it's not necessarily uh, a good idea. Similarly, many of you may have seen any of these uh, special effects action movies in a cinema. There, they use a very high quality sensor borderline 40,000, that's the consumer price of a video camera that you want to record for high dynamic range scenes. 
Similarly, people have looked at to this problem also from an algorithms, uh, algorithms perspective. So interpolation in painting, declipping, there's a long history, 30 years of research. Uh, good luck if you want to start today. It's a lot of catching up. But inherently, the problem remains the same. If the hardware has saturated the data, declipping de is only going to take you so far. And this is something I will show you later that uh, this cannot be improved just with algorithms. And then, of course, if you're interested in theoretical understanding, then there are very fundamental limitations in these kinds of discrete models. So that's what is happening today. Hardware people do hardware, software people do software. Once in a while, they collide and look at each other as if they don't understand what's happening. So if you are a signal processing person, then it's also very interesting what is happening between algorithms and hardware point of view in terms of thinking. So if you wind your clock back to 1600s, you have the Fourier, the golden age of Fourier analysis lead, lead, leads to all these kinds of representations. Then you have the wavelet revolution. So you have more sophisticated methods of modeling data, right? And then gradually nonlinear processing takes over. So you have sparse recovery methods. And finally, you have highly nonlinear methods like deep learning. But in all of these things, the acquisition still remains linear. Even for compressed sensing, the acquisition is linear. Very few examples, you will have nonlinear acquisition. But then it's a, it's a very timely thing to ask that can we have nonlinear acquisition on purpose, which gives us some kind of potential merit. Okay? So that's another philosophical view from a theoretical standpoint. How can we uh, break through from that? So I will try to walk through uh, uh, these different themes that we have been looking at. They're all application driven, but I will start with the foundations, which is sampling theory, because it's taught in most undergrad programs. So you will be able to at least appreciate the problem, if not the solution. So I will start with uh, a conceptual understanding of digital sensing pipeline. Then I will go through the overview and then just show you some, some of the new methods we have developed. Uh, how this has actually started from a purely theoretical pursuit to all the way a technology that we have tried to deploy here and there. And then new classes of inverse problems. So it's truly a computational sensing talk where you have a, a custom designed hardware that gives you something more and then how to le le leverage using algorithms. That's the main sort of idea. So unlimited sensing framework, that's what we call it. And let's see how it works. So again, if you start with the conventional e-book, let's say Open Iman Schaefer, you have this model of how to digitize information. We have an incoming signal F and you quantize the measurements and those quantized measurements will be called digital measurements, right? And this is an example. So black is the continuous signal, maybe your audio, and red is the quantized signal, which is your digital signal if you sample it. And the difference between red and uh, black is what is known as the quantization noise. And this quantization noise is coming from the process of quantization. And that's why digital representation is lossy because you always have quantization noise. In some philosophical sense, the question that we are asking here is what instead of measuring the quantized signal or the digital signal, what if we start to quantize the quantization noise? Is there a sampling theorem for that? Said differently from these red dots over here, uh, can we go back to the original signal? That's the mathematical question. And if it's possible, let's see where it goes, okay? So before I get to that point, actually what we are doing is not very different from this uh, old wisdom that appeared in New York Times. It comes from one of the NASA's program managers who said one person's uh, noise is another one, another one's signal. And this is purely the driving force of our work. We are actually trying to capture noise to be, to be very realistic and then trying to make sense of it. And in the process, we want to show that actually this is the right way in many cases. So let me give you an example just to start with what is the perception of this like, okay? So this is the hardware experiment. We built a full audio pipeline. Then we started to record some examples. So let me play the quantization noise as it sounds, okay? So. For some reason, let's see. Let me play again. I think it's playing, but not broadcasting. Maybe the speak the, the speaker volume is off. Maybe the volume is off. You want to raise the volume? Yeah. I can't seem to go back. Oops, 
you can kill and restart it. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Go again. One time. One time. Okay, let's let, can we go back and play again? So I, I don't know for how many this is intelligible, but the real recording after reconstruction from the algorithm is something like this. Let me tell the story of Bose-Einstein condensates, which is the coldest matter in the universe. And so this is the recovery from the pipeline. And this is the original. If you had the conventional Shannon Nyquist, and you'll hear this haze of shh in the background, that is purely because of the digital activation. Let me tell the story of Bose-Einstein condensates, which is the coldest matter in the universe. And this example is just for the perception sense that, you know, if you play record audio, what does it get to? And here you will see that, uh, you will see that blue is the measurement, red is the reconstruction. So in time domain, it's very clear that you will get very high dynamic range reconstruction. But if you go to the Fourier domain, then you can clearly see that the noise floor has substantially fallen down up to 18, 20 dB. And this is purely based on measurements, okay? So I'm showing you a real experiment here. So that's the perception you make from audio, audio signals. Now let's move to an image example. So here is an example of quantization noise in 2D. So this is how a camera would capture. And clearly it's impossible to read it from here, but if you want to do the high dynamic range reconstruction, it would look like this. So this is a very recent picture of two of my colleagues. And again, when you pass it through the algorithm, you can reconstruct. So in these two quick examples, what I've shown to you is very high dynamic range reconstruction. And for the same bit budget, much lower quantization noise. And this is for any digital acquisition, it's some kind of a very wondering uh, experiment. So what drives this kind of thing? So what is happening in conventional analog to digital conversion is that if the input passes the particular limit, the output saturates, and this is not natural. This is how most of the systems react. But in this kind of measurement system that I'm mentioning, which is modulo ADC, you have a periodic nonlinearity. So what you see on the in the figure D is that instead of signal just clipping, it starts to fold back. And now the problem is that there's no clear sense of how to go from red all the way to black. And that's where the computational sensing challenge is that in the hardware, let's say you make it possible, how do you go back algorithmically? So for those who are interested in topology, what's actually happening is that uh, when you have a measurement at a particular range, you are recording only the fractional part. And these kinds of measurements, they have a tendency to glue themselves on a circle, which is the modulo uh, mapping basically. But what happens here is something more uh, intricate. And over time, if you trace all these samples, what is happening is that you will trace a cylinder, which is S1 cross R space. And the goal would be that, you know, you have a low dimensional, you have a low, not a low dimensional, you have a low projection here. And you want to lift back to the right space. And that's why, that's how you physically get the high dynamic range reconstruction. So in some kind of analogy, it would be similar to the fact that you have a long thread and you, wind it on a spool so that now the thread needn't be stored in its full length. That's the hardware. Software is how to put the thread back to its right place. So now wh what could be the mathematical challenge here? Well, first challenge is that if you are used to thinking in the terms of Fourier sampling, Shannon Nyquist proof works with this idea that if you sample the spectrum aliases and you just want to sample fast enough so that the copies can be reconstructed. But that technology is not going to work here. The reason being, when you look at the red curve, it's going to give you Fourier domain aliasing. So you cannot use aliasing anymore. But then let's say you don't know about a uh, spectral uh, method of thinking, and you just try to do an intuitive example where you just fold the measurements with different kinds of uh, thresholds. Then the natural question would be that it seems like the sampling rate, how fast you should acquire should depend on the, uh, on the threshold, which is not very good for a system's design, because that means that now every time you are going to have a fold, you need to know the dynamic range. And it would almost be nothing short of a magic, actually, if you can like simultaneously address these two points. So 
the first thing that we started to explore was what is the recovery like here? And what this results show, what this result shows here is that actually, if you have an incoming signal that is band limited, that is typically your audio, bio, or whatever signal that you are dealing with, it turns out that the sampling rate doesn't depend on the modulo threshold. And this is somewhat remarkable because this is not what you would expect. So in that sense, it's the result for recovery is still like Nyquist Shannon. Constant factor over sampling recovers the input signal, doesn't matter how many times it folds, right? So what this result indirectly tells us is that provided that the sampling rate satisfies a particular criterion, aliasing is okay. And this is very surprising com compared to conventional like with uh, Shannon wisdom. And just to show you an example, red is the measurement over there. And you can see there's a high dynamic range reconstruction based on the algorithm, okay? So that's just to show you how the reconstruction guarantee looks like. Now, of course, when you present a guarantee like this, well, that why would you go making a measuring system from Shannon Nyquist to something else which looks a bit weird and let's say you can make it work will it actually work in hardware so when we had the first paper after that I basically spent two years building the hardware so now, now I have an example of a hardware here where you can see this in more in action so what is happening here is that as I'm cranking up the voltage of the of the yellow waveform you can see that the folds are increasing and this is where this is all happening in analog electronics. That means that your dynamic range limitation is now purely in analog, not in digital anymore. And this is a fundamental walk away from what is conventionally available to us. So here's an example. So when you get a hardware piece, you can do all kinds of wacky examples. So here's a sine wave coming out of a plug power socket in UK, 250 volts is converted to 50 volts. And you can all imagine that if you take 50 volts and put it to your computer, it's going to bust, right? But with this kind of sensor or technology, what you can do is you can still pass it. And here's an example of reconstruction. So you see a clear reconstruction uh, of the sine wave. So this is like a good first proof of concept that you know this eventually is going to work out the way you want. But then over the years, we are also very interested in theory. So we started to explore all kinds of different uh, theoretical ideas. What if the signals change like wavelet spaces, flying spaces, so the input signal class changes. What about different architectures? You have point-wise sampling, but there's also a lot of work on one-bit sampling. And then there's event-driven sampling, which is very much bio-inspired. And beyond just sampling models, you have also linear operators that are used consistently. For example, you have the radon transform used in tomography. How would it give us some access to high dynamic range tomography? So we looked at all, the, all of these things and many of, I will just walk up with the applications without giving you the theoretical details, but the main idea is that if it interests you, you can always have a look here. But I'm not the only one doing that. There are also other colleagues in the uh, in the field. They are looking at very different kinds of things from compressed sensing to signal recovery on graphs to even using algorithms that are based on wavelets. And, and I mean, at this point I've lost touch, but yeah, there's a lot of work happening in this kind of recovery, but not so much in hardware. So. How does the recovery look like? I'm going to quickly walk you through the proof of time domain and Fourier domain recovery, which gives you a sense of how this can work. And then I'm going to quickly walk through the examples. So what we have here is the conventional ADC pipeline that you are familiar with in any undergrad book. You have a pre-filter or the anti-aliasing filter. It makes sure that the input signal is band limited. You, what is new in this work is that you pass it through a modulo folding and this happens in analog. That's why you get the modulo samples, okay? And in notation, that's what you have. F is the input signal, phi is a band limited or anti-aliasing signal. You just sample, you get measurements Y. Uh, in equations, this is what the model looks like. G is the band limited signal. So it's Fourier, spec Fourier uh, representation is compactly supported and then modulo samples are Y. And we want to recover G from Y, that's the problem. Yeah. So in picture, you are given red measurements and you want to get blue, uh, the blue signal back, which is high dynamic range. So now you have the picture, you have the notation and everything is all set. So how does the recovery look like? Well, the first thing to notice here is that the modulo function is actually a difference between the original band limited function and it's piecewise constant function, which is like a TV sparse. So it's it has sparsity in the uh, total variation sense. So, the recovery actually is based on the idea that we are going to recover the TV sparse parts from the modulo part, and then we will add it back 
to the modulo samples. So then it's a pointwise reconstruction scheme. And this is the constructive proof for constant factor oversampling. So let me just quickly show in pictures what it looks like. So you have modulo samples, and you can see this is the modulo decomposition property. The signal on your left is decomposed into two parts, right? And now the idea is that the first idea that we are going to use is commutativity. So this commutativity has previously been seen in phase unwrapping, but only for first order difference because higher order differences cannot be inverted easily. So in principle, what is happening is that let's say you have some modulo samples, you compute its higher order difference, and then you do a modulo again. It turns out that creates an invariant. You can see that the input signal derivative is now matching the uh, sa uh, modulo samples uh, uh, higher difference, right? Now the goal is that from here we are actually going to trace back the PV sparse signal, and for that let's look at a, look at how it works. So if you have a band limited signal, it turns out that its finite differences are highly correlated. That means that if you take the finite difference, it's going to shoot. And an intuitive understanding of that would be. A sinusoid. So a sine function with zero frequency is a constant. If I increase the frequency slightly, then you can see the second curve, and you can see that now I have Nyquist samples and slightly oversampled samples in the black ink. So oh, black is basically getting more samples than Nyquist. And now if I perform the finite difference on the set, slightly more oversampling, I can see that for Nyquist red samples don't change, but the black samples because of oversampling start to shrink. That means that finite differences, they will shrink any small, uh, any smooth signal. And for the sine wave, it's very easy to compute that the finite differences will shrink as soon as you sample faster than three times Nyquist. So if the oversampling rate is three times Nyquist, you will start having shrinkage effect. For band limited, it's a little bit technical, so I don't put it here, but you can always check it in the paper. So for band limited, signals, it turns out that T omega E is the constant factor. And this constant factor allows you to shrink the, uh, the signal's uh, finite difference as soon as you go deeper into the derivatives. So essentially what happens is that whenever T is less than one over omega, which is omega is the signal bandwidth and E is the Euler constant, then you will start observing the shrinkage and your commutativity is guaranteed. So once the commutativity is guaranteed, you know that you have a sampling criteria. Now the goal is that how do you go from finite differences back to the original signal? So the machinery to do that is the following. What we do is from the modulo samples, we try to estimate this kind of TV sparse signal. And the rationale behind that is that we know that this range of the signal is fixed. And because the range is fixed at each iteration, we are able to actually uh, fix the range of the output by rounding off. Then once the signal is reconstructed, we just add it to the modulo samples and you get the original reconstruction. What I did not mention here is how to compute the constant of integration every time you unfold the TV sparse signal. That is based on a criterion from Bernstein's inequality, which is a little bit technical, so it's very hard to get in here. But the main idea is that one of the mathematical innovations of this method is that beyond the sampling criterion, you also have a method for con computing constants of integration from higher order differences of uh, functions. So what is the practical advantage of this method? Well. I'm showing you here uh, measurements from a, from a real oscilloscope. So you have an oscilloscope, you pass a sine wave through it, and then you use the modulo ADC, you pass a sine wave through it. And if you do the finite distance of first order, you can see that you already have a lot of noise on the black signal, which is conventional Shannon Nyquist method. And why is that? Well, for a very simple reason, higher the dynamic range, coarser the quantization, right? So what that means is that if the modulo dynamic range is smaller, you get much higher digital resolution. And this is something you can practically validate over here. So if you have quantization noise, you can model it as bounded noise and you again get a Nyquist-Shannon theorem. So this is not very surprising, but it's very uh, graceful in terms of, of theory practice thinking. Uh, so here's an example of recovery. And you can see that even though the, the, the measurements in figure A are very coarsely quantized in red ink, when you reconstruct, the you, you do get a, simulated digital gain, which is interesting because in real applications, it means that if you use this kind of ADC method, you will get a very interesting boost in uh, the digital resolution. So what are the implications for signal processing? So one of the most widely studied problems is audio declipping. It has 30 years of history. And the main idea is that people have, so these are two recent survey papers, but there's like N number of papers, uh, impossible to read all. But 
the main idea here is that all these algorithms try to reconstruct signal from clipped measurements. And what I want to show is that the, the algorithmic state of the art is fixed here in blue line, okay? This is fixed in blue line, and this is for a 16-bit A to D converter. If we digitize our samples with 5-bit A to D converter using the method I mentioned for audio, you already get up to 40 dB uh, reconstruction accuracy, which is quite, to me, it's, it's quite amazing because you get 20 dB gain above state of the art by just changing hardware. And we have tried it over 40 diff different data sets. It makes to make, seems to make complete sense. But again, if you do some kind of a simulation, you can see that for different bits, you get this constant 6 dB contours, which makes sense with, with respect to the conventional uh, wisdom in quantization literature. So why this is happening is because when you have clipped measurements, you have lost information and there's no way you are going to get it back. When you have folded measurements, the advantage is that it is lossy if you don't use algorithms, but if you use algorithms, it be this lossiness becomes actually your friend and then you get this sudden 18 dB, 20 dB boost in your reconstruction. So this is just for your eyes. You have an example of a clipped signal and then you use the same, same threshold for modulo and and you can see the reconstruction from blue to red. And again, this is also consistent with data. And in the gray aim, see that when you reconstruct the red samples, much higher digital resolution. All quantization artifacts in gray is lost now. And this is like a hardware example. So you can also now use optimization-based methods and do recovery in Fourier domain, which was previously challenging. So for those of you who are aware, uh, aware of phase unwrapping problem, you will, you will see that there are hardly any methods for Fourier domain reconstruction using phase unwrapping. So let's see how does this work in, for, in phase unwrapping context. So previously, the method that I gave you was a time domain method. It was for global real line, just like Shannon Nyquist. It's for global real line, right? And it used... Uh, some extra heuristics like your folds are always on the two lambda grid which is because of the quantization and so on and so forth but this method is really amazing because it's robust it doesn't really care about hardware non-idealities it can work with lower sampling rates it's almost agnostic to hardware sensing pipeline and this is what i will motivate through hardware examples but let me just first drive you through the initial insight into how Fourier domain reconstruction works so just to give you an example here are some hardware non-linearities you have delayed folds you have short noise uh, you have reset noise and these kinds of things always happen when you build a hardware. And it's always nice to have an algorithm that can blindly take care of all of these things. So for your domain recovery, again, I use the same old picture. You have a band limited signal and it's decomposition. Do its finite difference. Finite differences of band limited functions are band limited functions because they are vector spaces. Uh, for modulo, it looks something strange, but you know that for the step signal, it's TV sparse, so you get spikes only, okay? So now let's see what happens to this picture in Fourier domain, because that will be our driving uh, idea. So in the Fourier domain, because the signal is band limited, it will only be concentrated in one part of the spectrum, right? Rest, rest of the locations are empty. If you look at the spikes, then the spikes are going to be a trigonometric polynomial. So spikes in time become sinusoids in frequency domain, very basic uh, mapping. And therefore they will sit on the whole circle. So what this means is that we see the band limited picture, we see the spiky picture, we, come, we subtract the two, very easy. We know what is happening. Well, in the band limited part, you get garbage, but outside the band limited part, you have all the information about the folds in Fourier domain. And this is a very historical problem, dates back all the way to Prony. It's called Prony's method to estimate sinusoidal frequencies. So let's try to do that. So you have this uh, out of band information, you do spectral fitting. From the spectral fitting, you can directly estimate the folding times. From the folding times, you do one anti difference or come sum, and you get the step signal. You add it to the modulo, and you get reconstruction. Right. Now, the question is will it work in hardware? Turns out that it works quite well. Because in the hardware, uh, in the hardware, what's happening is that you can get these jumps which are not always on the grid, but because Prony's method is agnostic to these jump sizes, the reconstruction works invariably well. Now, the only question is that some of you may have been, uh, some of you may have known that Prony's method is a bit unstable in noise and perturbations, but there has also been a lot of advances in the last 20 years, which have given very interesting results and stable uh, reconstruction methods. So using any of those works quite well. Uh, so basically you can, again, write it as a mathematical guarantee what the reconstruction looks like, and then 
basically, this is an example. So here, here's a real world example. You have a function and you can see that it has been very coarsely sampled. And what you see in the red figure is the reconstruction using my previous algorithm in time domain. And then using this Fourier domain method, you can get a very tight reconstruction, almost reaching the mean squared error of your accusation system. And similarly, uh, as I mentioned, this method is agnostic to the folding rate. So it doesn't depend how the signal folds. Invariably, it will reconstruct without caring about the input uh, uh, folds. So now for the remaining, I guess I have 15 minutes, right? Okay. So now what I have is a set of inverse problems that I want to walk you through because I know that most of you will be working in a different kind of inverse problem. But the main idea is that when you have an inverse problem, you have a continuous time process and you try to map it into these discrete measurements. So you have a continuous world information through a physical system. You will map and then you get these discrete measurements. And generally the trick is that you are going to linearize the system and call it AX equals B. Uh, <clears throat> what is different in our work is that instead of having AX equals B, we, we are going to pose the inverse problem as module of AX equals B. Uh, if some of you are familiar with inference and statistics, it's typically called the generalized link model and generalized link function. So if you look at the landscape of inverse problems, there's like this whole theory of how to regularize sparse and least squares methods. But, but when you have nonlinear, non-convex methods like modulo, though the, the range of possibilities is very narrow because there hasn't been many algorithms there. So if you are interested in algorithms, then that's one way to attack this kind of a problem. But coming back to the generalized link function, some of you may have seen some of these examples before. For example, sine function gives you one bit, absolute gives you phase retrieval, exponential mapping gives you random Fourier features and so on and so forth. But what we are looking at is generally the idea of modulo or a folding down linearity to minimize the dynamic range and at the same time give you very high digital resolution. So in terms of inverse problems, we have looked at different kinds of inverse problems, example, low complexity sampling, how to do high dynamic range imaging, 3D imaging, tomography, and more recently things like computer, uh, array, array signal processing, radars, and as well as communication systems like MIMO. So let me see how many I can walk you through. So low complexity sampling, this is a very interesting idea. The idea is that instead of doing Shannon Nyquist, people started to do something which is bio-inspired. So what is the bio-inspired part here? Well, look at your neurons. They only fire when there is an input, right? If there's no information, no need to act. And this is known as event-driven sampling. And based on this kind of an idea, many neuroscientists, especially dating back to Huxley and Hodgkin, they had this biological model of how the neuron anatomy looks like. Then some people made advances, transferred it to an electrical circuit. And then some people took it forward to a mathematical concept where you get this integrate and fire model for sampling outputs. And in this integrate and fire output, it's again the same problem. If the dynamic range of the signal in, uh, increases, you either get very erratic firings or you get no firings at all. So for example, you have these gaps because the signal went past the dynamic range and then you don't get any firing. So this is, like I said, dynamic range is a fundamental problem. So it's also going to affect all kinds of neuron inspired or event driven systems. So what we did here is we developed an algorithm where if you put modulo in front of an event driven system, so this is a 1D example, you can see that from the input modulo, because the modulo folds the signal back into the dynamic range of the event driven sampler, you can still perform reconstruction. So let's do a laboratory example. So you build the hardware, you make a asynchronous sigma delta. And when you club the things together, you can see that from these series of spikes, uh, which would not be possible to reconstruct using a conventional event-driven system, you, here you can still reconstruct it quite well. This idea also goes back to one bit sigma delta. So one bit sigma delta typically will saturate. And then again, you would have same kind of distortion as you can see in this slide for reconstruction. But then if you put module in front of one bit sigma delta, then you have reconstruction guarantees based on which you can reconstruct. You can also do single shot high dynamic range imaging. So for many of you who are using a smartphone, your phone must have an inbuilt high dynamic range feature, which, and the way it works is that it takes multiple exposures like those, and then it stitches them together to create one single high dynamic range image. And there are quite a few challenges here. For example, what if a person moves between the shots? how quickly to take the shots, how many of them, and so on and so forth. 
So can we have a single high dynamic range imaging system? It turns out that yes, with algorithms you can. So here's an example where in the red, you actually see the measurement and the reconstruction is in gray. I mean, this example is a bit exaggerated, but it shows to you that if you use the algorithm on the folded measurements of quantization noise, you can actually unfold the full pixel profile. And in reconstruction, it looks something like this. So you have the quantization noise over there, and then the reconstruction looks something like that. So one of the things to think about is that I've shown you theory for band-limited signals, but images are not band-limited. So how does the reconstruction work? So just want to give you a very quick peek here. Well, it turns out that when you have a lens, a micromirror in front of the pixel, it acts like a local point spread function. And these point spread functions uh, are very uh, are very matched to the theory of image reconstruction, which is based on typically splines or wavelet classes. So what we have found is that if you model this kind of a system, so here are different examples of quantization noise uh, measurements and then the corresponding uh, residue image or the quantized image. But the main idea here is that a lot of this hard work was done by Kolmogorov, who actually showed that for spline classes, if you look at their finite differences, their growth rates are bounded. And all we have to do is just mix it up with our theory of recon reconstruction from folded measurements. And again, for, for even images, you get this kind of a sampling criterion and this sampling rate tells you that you, can, will, you will have a single image reconstruction with high dynamic range provided that the sampling guarantee is satisfied. Uh, you can also map it to time-resolved imaging. So time-resolved imaging is basically, uh, in, in signal processing sense, it's the vanilla super-resolution problem. You have low-pass filtered spikes and you actually measure the, uh, you want to recover these spikes. And one of two examples are over here. So here is a ground penetrating radar and you have some clipping problem. And in the second example, you have an ultrasound data. And again, you have clipped first pulse and you don't know what to do. So what we did is we tried to develop some theory for time of flight imaging. So in time of flight imaging, what is happening is that if you put a glass sheet between the imaging point, so whenever you take a picture from a plane or a train window, you see these nasty reflections that you want to remove. With time of flight imaging sensors, you can remove them because what is happening is that instead of getting one garbage measurement, you get this kind of a time pro profile. And this time profile then can be used to separate these spikes. So when you separate these spikes, you can actually see things behind diffusive medium or between glass sheet and so on and so forth. But again, here, the problem is that you can see one of the reflections have a very high dynamic range compared to the other one. And that's why you need something to, to tackle this kind of a challenge. So what we did is again, an experiment, but here the algorithm is truly, uh, what it does is that it takes the blue data, which is folded data. So here's an oscilloscope screenshot. You take the blue data, instead of unfolding it, it directly estimates the spikes and does super resolution. So this is a, this is more like an algorithmic example or an algorithmic innovation where you have folded measurements as the input, but you do super resolution with spikes at the output directly without unfolding. And again, you can do some guarantees and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also apply the same idea to tomography. So here's a very interesting uh, example from Chen et al. in 2015. They are saying that make measurements with different radiation levels, especially for... Um, uh, especially for, uh, you know, like uh, x-ray inspection at the airport, what they do is they, they radiate with different levels just to see what's in your suitcase. Similarly, this could also be for dental reasons and so on. So you can make a similar theory for a modular radon transform. So instead of just taking the radon transform, you start taking the modular radon transform. So those of you who are familiar with Shep Logan Phantom, instead of getting the radon transform, you'll get something folded like this. You can again piggyback on the, on the theory and then start making all the... Uh, all the reconstruction methods. So here's an example. Again, we took some open source radon transform data sets. Uh, we passed it through our hardware, tried to run our reconstruction algorithm, and then just trying to benchmark. And again, as usual, you would get high dynamic range reconstruction with very high digital resolution. You can also do array signal processing. Uh, in array signal processing, you have a sensor array. And based on the acquisition, you want to do like direction of arrival estimation, beam forming, and so on. In fact, when you are hearing a person, the, the reason why you know where is the person compared to your head is because of the two ears you have. So if you're not familiar that, that in real time, you're actually doing source localization based on your ears. So again, in error signal processing, it's a very popular problem. You have uh, this kind of uh, near, near signal makes a stronger imprint on the, on the sensor array, farther away signal is weak. You want to find both. So you can again do this kind of uh, thinking. So. I'll just skip over this part, but the main idea is that uh, 
using these kinds of matrix operations, you can again get the input. And again, you don't have to unfold because of the, of the uh, properties of these matrices. So here's the cool thing. You have these red data points, which are folded measurements, and you can directly find the direction of arrivals based on the algorithm. And you can potentially use reuse the previous machinery like music after some pre-processing steps. Uh, I will skip the MIMO part. I want to show this because it's done with Thomas. So here's an example of a radar system, which uh, we have built time and time again, just for our own fun. But here's an example of Thomas at Imperial. This is a radar system. He's shaking his hand and you can see that the profile of the radar up and down clearly shows that with modulo and not modulo, you, you get consistent reconstruction. Now the true, wh wh where does this technology shine actually? It truly shines when you have a weak and a strong target. So let's say you have a reflector which is really far away and a reflector very close. Typically in a conventional sensor, there's no way you can read it off because it will fall below the quantization noise floor. But the example here, you can see that in the vertical line, uh, in red ink, you see the unlimited sampling method and you can clearly see that the weak target is consistently spotted without any ambiguity. And that's how you can actually get to the uh, development of this kind of complete transition of uh, ideas to, uh, to practice. Okay, so just to close this talk, I wanted to say that uh, co-design in particular, both hardware and algorithms is very useful. In this particular talk, I just wanted to show that you can have much advanced digital sensing in terms of dynamic range and digital resolution if you try to fold the measurements. And finally, uh, for the case of inverse problems, actually you can think of your favorite inverse problem that you work on. You can always ask the question, what is the source of measurement and why should it not be restricted with the dynamic range? And oftentimes you will find that if you try to build the system from scratch, you will actually run into this problem. It's just that you are for the moment lucky that somebody did all the hard work. So thank you for your time and uh, happy to take any questions. So thank you, Ayush, for this fantastic talk. I'm sure there's gonna be some questions. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, Ayush. I have a question. So uh, if we would, um, if there would be like a, a big, um, goal of transforming the ADCs to the unlimited sampling framework. What would be the key challenges you would identify that need to be overcome to to make all the ADCs uh, based on unlimited sampling? Uh, having one of these boards open source in analog, you just put this behind below before the ADC. You are all set. So just open source this would be. We haven't made it open source because of patent issues, but with Thomas, Thomas can testify. You just put it in front of radar and you get it. So there are no technical open no. questions. No, I mean you can always have technical open questions like hardware questions. How can I make a chip out of it? How can I push it to mega uh, mega hertz frequencies? How can I make it efficient? Or what will be the heat dissipation? What is the ideal bit rate capacity for these things? So those questions will come with the interplay of how you map this to the hardware, but truly the, the innovation is having it in analog and then ADC doesn't matter. So it's not like changing the ADC, it's changing what enters the ADC that is folded in analog electronics. If we had to change ADC, I, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> it would have been a slow ride. Thank you, Ayush, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering for the um, unlimited sampling theorem, there is this constant E you have. Yes. And uh, do you think it's it's tight or? Uh... No. I, I have a unpublished result where three times Nyquist is upper bound. It's the optimal upper bound. You cannot improve that. So you have a counter example below that showing that uh, you cannot recover any signal? Uh, you can actually prove that uh, if you are below three times Nyquist, the modulo commutativity will break. Currently, the proof relies on Taylor series, which is not for entire functions. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the gap is. The bound is not tight because you are trying to use model and uh, an entire function with a polynomial series like Taylor. So you get gaps in approximation orders. Mm -hmm. And that can be tightened much more if you use a theory for entire functions. And there you can show that three times Nyquist will is needed to guarantee this commutativity. So what you have, I2's condition for phase unwrapping becomes three times Nyquist for unlimited sampling for higher order.
right. instances. Makes but, sense. Yeah. Okay, I have a second question, if I may. Um, so here for the inverse problem formulation, I don't remember, but uh, maybe you can recall that. Um, do you first unfold the measurement and then solve the inverse problem, or do you have a single step strategy? Uh, case by case. So for example, for radon transform, we would like to very much have something like a Fourier slice projection theorem. So we are working towards that. So currently we unfold and then do inverse like fil the filtered back projection. But for the star super resolution problem that I mentioned, you can actually directly recover spikes without unfolding. So it's really like case by case uh, complexity of the mathematical technology inside. Okay, thank you. So does anyone has any question? Thank you for the nice talk. Um, so my question is more on the uh, like more on the experimental stuff. Like uh, so, you showed a uh, the quantization noise, and then you recover the image. So typically, like when we use uh, any standard cameras or something, we don't get the the quantization. Or, like so, how was the experiment done? Like could you? So, uh, so that experiment was not an experiment; it was a simulation. But okay. one of my colleagues I used to share office with Gordon Wettstein. He has actually built a system doing that last year. Okay. And I can direct you to that, but he has actually built the system to do this kind of reconstruction with this with a with a with a sensor that records modular quantization noise. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you talked about the in playing in in seeing differences are decreasing so but i guess this is this was more at, at the algorithmic level of trying to 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 see how you can unfold your 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 fully is it possible to to rethink this uh, the this this theory in in trying to sense in a domain where you don't need the dynamic range you you can remap your you were talking yeah. about the finer differences right so what if my sensor were able to measure differently and it relates to your neurons and things too instead of measuring absolute values i would measure finer differences um so, how, how much more difficult would that be to doing so modules? actually it's a very relevant question and Historically, people have tried to look into this kind of system in the name of differential pulse code modulation, DPM. There, they thought that actually measuring the slightly like a finite difference on continuous analog electronics would be a good idea. But the reason that technology did not take over is because when you compute this kind of finite difference in analog electronics, it's very noisy. So, but the idea is very much, uh, very much on 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 the spot because. Our thinking is that you don't have to use finite differences. If there's something that we have learned from wavelets, it's that that wavelets act like finite differences. So you can, wavelets have a dual role of stabilizing noise at the same time, giving you bandpass information. I think if that kind of a system, if, if instead of DPCM or differential PCM, you had a wavelet PCM, it would be like very interesting. But that's the, that's the farthest uh, I know. In fact, it was one of the comments from our, our initial reviewers that why not do that? And we actually built a system to try that, but we could see immediately that analog uh, differential pair in analog gives you a lot of noise. Thanks. Okay, does anyone else has any other questions? Otherwise, I think we are right on time to go for a coffee break. So I just wanted to, make, yes. I, I forgot to say one thing. Uh, we also have a demo here. Uh, one is on the radar with Thomas. Another one is uh, with, so actually two of my group members, Ruming Guo, who's a postdoc, and Yu Liang, who's an undergrad at Imperial, they, they are doing a demo here. So if you're interested in the technological part, please feel free to talk to them. I did not mention this before. So thank you, Thomas. <laughs>